Okay, well, we'll let people, we'll let people sit down. Yeah. yeah. If it wasn't for the last minute, nothing would ever get done. Okay, so um, maybe maybe we maybe we can start. So uh, my name is Tom DeGrand. I'm the local organizer for the Tassie Summer School. Um, so what I have my my job is to introduce uh, Tassie, which is why we're here, and then introduce the speaker. So um, Tassie is uh, an acronym. It's the Theoretical Advanced Study Institute, and what it is is a month-long summer intensive program for graduate students in theoretical elementary particle physics. Okay. And it's been in Boulder for 31 years, okay? And each year has a different set of scientific organizers. Uh, this year, uh, the organizers are Tom Hartman from Cornell, uh, Leonardo Rastelli from Stony Brook, uh, Natty Zyberg from uh, the Institute for Advanced Studies, and uh, Chi Yin from Harvard. Um, TASI is funded by the National Science Foundation, okay? And um, it's the most successful and famous school of its kind in the world, full stop. Okay, uh, these tremendous young people pass through here for a, for a little while. Uh, we go to their talks. The old people try to figure out what's going on, uh, and then you know, 20 years later, somebody walks up to me at a conference and says, uh, "You don't remember me, but I was in Boulder in 1995, and it was a wonderful experience." So we are incredibly lucky to have to have it here. Okay, so we have to give back. So uh, we do a public lecture. Okay, so our speaker uh, tonight is Natty Zyberg. He's a member of the Institute for Advanced Studies, uh, which is this uh, science place in New Jersey. Okay, uh, uh, he's a well-known theoretical physicist. Um, what? Okay, so I have to go non-technical. Uh, what he's famous for is fi is finding connections between systems which superficially look very, very, very different. And yet, there are these ways that you can connect the behavior in these very different things, uh, one to each other. This is sort of a job description for a very good physicist. And so um, anyhow, so that's why he's here. Uh, he has received many awards, but he said, I didn't write down the important ones. So I will just say he received many awards. Uh, he has a MacArthur uh, back in the day, and he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And the title of his talk is The Frontiers of Fundamental Physics. Thank you, Tom. Can you hear me at the back? Good. And so I thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. And I thank all of you for coming. And the purpose of this talk is to give you a status report about fundamental physics, where we are, how we got here, and where we might be heading. But in order to do that, I first have to say what is physics. So physics is about explaining phenomena at different length scales. And you will see different length scales throughout the talk. And we'll talk a lot about what happens at very short distances, where we study the nature of matter, what matter is made of. We'll talk about molecules, atoms, elementary particles. And that's at short distances. And we'll also talk about long distances. And at increasingly long distances, we'll talk about the Earth and the solar system. We'll talk quite a lot about planets our galaxy, and maybe other galaxies, and maybe the universe as a whole. So first of all, the one-line summary, we are today in a very unusual and almost unprecedented situation in physics, in the sense that we have two standard models of physics. I'll discuss both of them during the talk. One of them discusses the situation at very short distances, and the other discusses the situation at very long distances. And these models work extremely well. There's almost no contradiction between theory and experiment. The agreement, when there is agreement, is spectacular. i say it's unprecedented. I'll give examples uh, later in the talk. And this has led some people to say that science is over. Physics is over. All the questions that will ever be, that will ever be understood are already understood. There's nothing new to be discovered, nothing new to be understood. 
In fact, some people publish books like Physics is in Crisis, Physics is Over. There is nothing else to be discovered. So if you take away only one lesson from this talk, is that what I've just said is completely, completely wrong. Physics is not over. There is a lot to be discovered. And my goal today is to convince you that this is indeed the case. And the reason this is the case is that there are ex excellent, extremely strong arguments telling us that there must be new physics beyond these two models that I will discuss. And furthermore, there will be a new experimental situation, new experimental input very soon that will help us make progress. So I said that here we are in, a, in an unusual and almost unprecedented situation. And the key word here is the almost. Because I'm going to argue that we were in a very similar situation at 1900. So let what happened in 1900. In 1900, Lord Kelvin gave a talk, a very big talk, with the title 19th Century Clouds over the Dynamical Theory of Heat and Light. So first a few words about Lord Kelvin. His original name was William Thomson, and he was later called, in recognition of his achievements, scientific achievements, he was later called First Baron Kelvin. He was one of the leading physicists at the time, and he made fundamental contributions to electricity and thermodynamics. He was kind of the highest authority at the time. And in physics, the Kelvin scale of temperature was named after him, again, in recognition of his achievement. So in 1900, he was asked to summarize the situation in physics, where we are and where we might be heading. And the title of his talk was 19th Century Clouds over the Dynamical Theory of Heat and Light. So in 1900, physicists have known two had known beautiful models. They had beautiful, detailed description of matter, heat, and light. This was the end of the century. And some people felt that maybe physics is over. Maybe we understand everything there is to understand. Very similar to what we hear today. And Lord Kelvin gave the talk, and he highlighted these clouds, these little details that did not quite work. These little details that did not quite work with the understanding at the time. And he understood that they're very important. And he said, these are clues to focus our attention to how to proceed. So I'll be a little bit technical. These are the two clouds. One was an experiment, the Michelson-Morley experiment. The details are not important. And the second was an effect called black body radiation. These two, the first of them was the beginning of, the, of Einstein's theory of relativity. And the second was the one of the roots of quantum mechanics. So during the 20th century, there were several revolutions in physics. Two of them were quantum mechanics and relativity. And they grew directly out of these clouds, these little details that did not quite work. So these clouds were the first sign of big storms. Storms which completely changed our understanding of nature and completely changed our everyday life through the change in technology. So the almost complete understanding of physics in 1900 was far from the truth. There were great things to be discovered. And the way they were discovered was by focusing on these little details that did not quite work, these little clouds over the horizon. So some people, I've read some people say, even today, misinterpreted Kelvin's talk. And they thought, or even think today, that Kelvin indeed thought that everything is over. Everything was understood. So it's a fascinating talk to read. It's available online. And Kelvin completely understood the significance of the clouds. He viewed them as the clues that should, we should focus, that to focus our attention on these clouds, these little things that don't work, that will tell us how to proceed further. So what we'll do today is try to imitate Kelvin's talk. So we'll review where we are. We'll review the successes in all of physics, and at the same time, we will also give a description of the clouds, these little things that do not quite work, these little things which should be viewed as the clues how to proceed. In order to do that, I first want to give you a flow chart of how physics research works. And of course, it's a little bit simplistic, and not everything works according to the flow chart, but kind of the broad brush picture 
this is how physics progresses. And the first time I present it, it might look a little bit artificial or abstract, but then I'll give examples and I'll demonstrate uh, these steps. So the first thing, we collect data. We collect a lot of data. There are many experimentalists and measure many different things. And then some smart people find a pattern in the data. So we replace a lot, a lot of numbers that were measured by very simple rule, qualitative rule or a formula, which still has some numbers that need to be measured. We refer to them as parameters. This is an enormous simplification because instead of carrying tons of data with numbers and tables and so forth, we just need to measure a few numbers and we can explain a lot using these numbers. The next step is the why question. Why is this pattern that was understood, why is it true? What's the underlying reason behind the pattern? And we'll see examples of this soon. The next thing to do is, to, of course, to understand these remaining parameters, these numbers that were not yet understood. And we collect more and more data, we find more and more parameters, and then we go to the beginning and find a new model that explains these parameters. And during the history of physics, we have seen a lot of this thing, how the input parameters for today's model are really output parameters of a more detailed model that we'll understand tomorrow. So this will be one of the themes of the talk, and let me give the first example of that. So I'm going to start with ancient time and describe the motion of the planets. So starting with the Babylonians, the ancient Greek, the ancient Egyptians, they were very interested in the stars, that of course they lived here and looked at the sky, that looked fascinating, and they realized that some stars are more or less stationary, but other stars move around, and they move in very complicated trajectories. And the technical word that they used was epicycles. They thought that the stars move on a circle within circles within circles. And it was quite complicated. So this is first st step one, collecting data. It took several centuries until these three people, Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler, realized that there is a pattern. Instead of having complicated motions of circles within circles, they invented the heliocentric model where the sun is in the middle and the other planets moving ellipses around them, around the sun. And this is an enormous simplification because instead of having very complicated numbers for the trajectories of all the planets, everything is much simpler. It looks complicated to us because we move with the Earth around the sun, but from the point of view of the sun, the trajectories are a lot simpler. But there are still some parameters that they couldn't understand at the time, and these are the radii of these ellipses. The planets move in ellipses around the sun, and the size of the ellipses had to be measured. So this was input to the story. Then you had to understand why it is ellipses. We'll come to that. But during, using this information, you could predict all the huge set of numbers that people started collecting, starting with the ancient Babylonians. Now at this point, Kepler was very ambitious. In addition to finding his three laws for the motion of the planets, he had another idea for the motion of the planets. He wanted to predict the size of the orbit. These numbers that were parameters that he had to measure, he wanted to have a, more, a deeper theory that explains them. And his theory was really ingenious. At the time, people knew that there are five platonic solids. This was known from the time of the ancient Greek. These are the tetrahedron, the cube, octahedron, etc. And they knew that there could be only five and only five such platonic perfect solids. And then Kepler at the time knew of six planets, and he thought that the planets move on spheres, and the spheres are inscribed inside these platonic solids, and the, both inside and outside. Altogether, there are five platonic solids and six spheres, and they're kind of inscribed in each other. And what can be nicer than that? First of all, we use very deep mathematics, the fact that there are five and only five platonic solids. So that's clearly nice, this is a deep fact. And that explains why we have six planets. Well, what can be nicer than that is deep mathematics explains heavenly objects. And he wrote how excited he was about this idea. Well, this idea is completely wrong. It's wrong, first of all, because he himself realized that the planets move on ellipses, not on circles. That's the first thing. The second thing, he knew the sizes of these, and the sizes didn't fit. 
And the real killer of the idea is that now we know that there are more than six planets. We have five platonic solids, but only six planets. So much for this idea. Today we understand that this was the wrong question. This was the wrong question because the fact that the planets move around the sun in ellipses, this is a deep fact that Kepler understood. The size of the planet, of the orbit of the planet, is not deep. This is a property of our solar system. We continue, every day now we discover, we, mankind, we discover new planets moving around other stars, they're called exoplanets, and the trajectories of the planets there have different sizes. So the sizes of the orbits in, the so in our solar system are just some random numbers, and over there, these are other random numbers. We say that these numbers are environmental. So this turns out to be the wrong question. We'll come back to that later. So the first step in my flow chart was collecting data. We talked about that. The second part was understanding a pattern. We talked about that. The next step was the why question. Why do we have the pattern? And for that, we needed Newton. Newton invented classical mechanics. He invented it partly in order to understand the motion of the planets. In fact, at the time, and until several centuries later, classical mechanics was referred to as celestial mechanics. And the reason for the name celestial mechanics is that it explains the motion of stars. It was not designed to explain motion in every day. It wasn't designed to explain something much deeper than that. So Newton understand the laws of, of mechanics, classical mechanics, he also understood the gravitational force that attracts the sun and the planets. And he derived from that the fact that they move on ellipses. This is an enormous step forward. We don't have to assume that the planets move on ellipses. We can derive that the planets move on ellipses. So this was a great achievement. But at that point, Newton made a very interesting switch. He was concerned by the following question. If you take into account the motion of the planets around the sun, you take into account the attraction between the sun and the planets, you can derive the fact that the planets move in ellipses. In doing this calculation, he neglected the attraction between the planets and themselves. Sometimes they're closer, sometimes they're further away. Also, occasionally there would be a comet that passes through. It also attracts the planets. So Newton was very concerned that the solar system is unstable. If you neglect all these other effects, the planets move on ellipses, and that's stable and that's beautiful. But there are all these other things that are being neglected, and if we ne don't neglect them, the solar system might disappear. In the solar system, you know, this planets could hit each other, the planet could leave the trajectory, the ellipse, and fall into the sun and burn, or might be ejected totally out of the solar system. And here we made a really interesting switch, which is quite amazing psychologically. He was a brilliant man. He did all this brilliant work. And he had this beautiful model, which worked so well. And he did not trust his own model. So he figured out, why is the solar system so stable? So Newton was a very religious person. And he figured that the only way the solar system could remain stable is if every once in a while, God comes in and readjusts the motion of the planets, making sure that they stay on these beautiful trajectories. So the historian Michael Hoskin described that in a beautiful way. He described that as saying that God demonstrated his continuing concern for his clockwork universe by entering in what we might describe as a permanent servicing contract. So every once in a while, he comes to make sure you know that your HVAC system at home works well, and he would adjust the planets to come. Today we know that Newton's concern was completely justified. The solar system is unstable. If you indeed take, it shows you how brilliant he was. Not only did he understand the solar system and how it works, he also understood that it's unstable. But the time scale for the instability of the solar system is a lot longer than the age of the solar system, and therefore there is no concern. So this is the end of my first example of the flow chart. We talked about collecting data, identifying the pattern, and then understanding why the pattern is there. This is the why question. 
And then we will still have these leftover parameters that need to be understood. And in that particular case, now we know that this was not a good question to ask. As a second example, I want to discuss chemistry. So chemistry also has a very long and interesting history. And the first step is, of course, collecting data. So for centuries, people collected data about materials, a lot of data, including by the work of the alchemist. So the alchemist wanted to create gold, and that goal was misguided. Yet, they did wonderful work, which is, again, a typical thing in science. Sometimes what you do turns out to be totally useless for the reason you did it, but becomes fundamentally important for other reasons. So these are the alchemists, and this is, you can see here, the gold he was trying to make. So they collected a lot of data. So the next step after collecting the data is finding the pattern. That happened more recently. This was happened in 1869, and this year we celebrated 150 years since Mendeleev's this, the realization of the periodic table. I think we have it here also. Shows you how important it is. It's still on the wall. And he realized that materials are made out of compounds, and the compounds are made out of elements. There are about 100 elements. Not all of them were known at this time. And they can be arranged in such a periodic table. So this is a pattern that explains some of the previous observations. As we move to the right in the table, these elements become heavier and heavier. And along the columns, they have similar properties. So all the elements in the same column have similar properties. So this is the pattern. This was understood to the late, the end of the 1800s. And the next step after the pattern is always the why question. Why do we have this periodic table? And this was understood in the 20th century. It's understood with quantum mechanics. And the underlying reason for the periodic table is the structure of atoms. We have <clears throat> a nucleus at the center made of protons and neutrons. It's drawn not to scale here. And there are electrons moving around. And in reality, the nucleus is a lot smaller. And if I put it here, you couldn't have seen it in this picture. And the time for that, the, time, the first time stamp for quantum mechanics can be thought of as being the first Solvay conference in 1911. And these are the leading physicists at the time. So among them, Curie, Poincaré, Planck, Rutherford, and Einstein. Some of them will appear later in the talk. And Ernest Solvay was the benefactor. He organized the conference. Such scientific conferences were not common until that time. And he had the idea of bringing all these scientists together, let them talk with each other, and maybe that would be fruitful. So it's amusing to note that, <clears throat> sorry, a, Mr. Solvay himself, this is him, couldn't come up to this photo opportunity. So they left the chair open, it was not open, and he didn't come. And then he came later, and they took the photos and glued it in. So maybe that was the first photo chops. So this was 1911, and during 16 years, physics com was completely transformed. I think the timestamp for the end is the 1927 Solvay Conference. And again, all the great physicists of the time came together, among them Schrodinger, Dirac, Bohr, Planck, Curie, Lorentz, Einstein, and many others. And during this period of time, the structure of the atom was understood, the rules of quantum mechanics were understood, and most of the reason, underlying reasons for the periodic table were also understood. But not everything was understood. There are still remaining parameters that need to be understood. These parameters that should be fed into the model, for example, the mass of the electron, the masses of the nuclei. And today we know that this understanding of quantum mechanics and the way it influences chemistry is correct. It was the root of most of the technology around us Every time you turn on your cell phone, or you use your microwave oven, or whatever, you really test quantum mechanics. So it really works. And, but there are some details that need to be understood, like where did these masses come from, etc. So this is the end of my second example of the flow chart. We talked about collecting data and understanding the pattern, understanding why we have the pattern, and identifying the remaining parameters, and on and on it goes. I would now like to switch to the two standard models that we have today, 
standard models of, I'll start with the standard model of particle physics. So during the past decades, two standard models were created. One of them is for particle physics, and we have a nearly perfect model describing all of physics down to tiny distances, then to the minus 19th of a meter. This is less than one billionth the size of an atom. So this is really very tiny. And the second standard model, the standard model of, of cosmology, it's again a nearly perfect model that explains the physics at very long distances, going roughly to 10 to the 26 meters. Notice the huge range of distances that we understand, ranging from tiny distances, 10 to the minus 19, all the way to 10 to the 26. And we describe the whole entire visible universe and also the early universe. I'll give more details about these two models. And let me now start by describing the first one, the particle model of particle physics. So this is a long and beautiful story, which could justify a talk just on its, about this topic, but I'll summarize it here only in a few slides. So it describes the elementary particles and the forces between them. And at least in principles, all of nuclear physics, all of atomic physics, chemistry, and even biology follow from this model. We know the right equations. We think we know the right equations. We have a lot of reasons to believe that these equations are right, but that's not the full story. In physics, we also need to solve the equations, and we cannot solve the equations because they're so complicated. Hence, the in principle. The in principle means that if we only had powerful enough computers and powerful enough methods to solve the equations, we'll be able to understand all of chemistry and all of biology. This is probably not going to happen anytime soon. But as far as understanding the fundamental rules, that's what we have. So that's what I said. In most circumstances, we cannot solve the equations, but we can solve the equations in enough situations, and we can measure enough things to be convinced that this story is right. So how do we collect the data? In order to collect the data, we need a powerful microscope or a powerful mag magnifying glass that allows us to explore what happens at very short distances. And the way we do it in practice is we collide either protons and electrons and look at the debris. So these are two protons come in and they interact and some debris comes out. They come in and interact and some debris comes out. And we place detectors around the interaction and the detectors measure all the debris that comes out, which particles come out, how often they come out, at which angle they come out, at what energy. And this gives us information about what happens here at the point of the interaction. Now, in practice, this is not the way it looks. It looks more like that. This is an accelerator. This is an aerial photo of the area of the state-of-the-art accelerator today. It's called LHC. It's the, an acronym for Large Hadron Collider. It's in a laboratory called CERN. Again, it's an acronym for Center for European Center for Nuclear Research near Geneva, Switzerland. In fact, that's not what it looks like, even though I said that, because the accelerator that appears here in this circle, and this is an, an older accelerator which is still being used, also is a smaller circle. They are 100 meters underground, so such an aerial photo, you're not going to see that, because they are 100 meters underground. So just to get a scale of the size of this, these are the runways of the Geneva International Airports. So this thing is really huge. It's 100 meter underground. And the circumference here is 17 miles, much more than the runways of the, air, of the airport. So this is where they do the experiment. And what comes out of it is a very detailed model with equations. And it has the following elements. First, it's based on principles. And the principles are principles of quantum mechanics, and special relativity. Recall, these, were the two, these are the two theories that came out of Kelvin's clouds, it came out of these little details that did not quite work in 19th century physics, quantum mechanics and special relativity. We also have some matter particles, electrons. We talked about them. These are the particles that move around the nucleus. And quarks, these are particles that are inside the nucleus. And some forces. Electromagnetic force, this was understood already in the 19th century. And two other forces that were understood during the 20th century, the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. And as always, we have some parameters, some numbers that the model does not predict. We have to put into the model, 
And then using these numbers, we can compute other things. For example, the masses of the particles or the strength of the forces. Let me say a few words about the matter particles. So we talked about the electron, it's here. And we talked about quarks. Now we know there are six quarks and they have funny names. The details are not important. And there are other particles, muon and tau, and some particles called neutrinos. So these are the matter particles of the universe. Everything in the universe is made out of them. And they are arranged here in a table. As we move to the right in the table, these particles become heavier and heavier. And all the particles in each row have similar properties. For example, they have the same electric charge. Does this sound familiar? Well, it's a lot like the periodic table of Mendeleev that you see over there. With one difference, that today we know why we have this periodic table. We have no idea why we have this periodic table. And we know what, in order to understand this periodic table, complete revolution of physics came in. Quantum mechanics came in and explained this periodic table. We can only imagine what will come in to explain this periodic table. This is an open question that we st still don't know. So we need to explain this pattern that was understood. The last element in the standard model is the Higgs boson. This is the particle that gives masses to the particle, the matter particles, and the weak force. It was discovered in 2012 in this laboratory, LHC, that I mentioned before. And this was the last particle that, of the standard model that was discovered. We can think of it as the keystone of the standard model. The keystone is this central stone in the summit of an arch. It's very much like all the other stones, except that it's so important that it holds the whole arch together. So we can think of the Higgs boson as a, this keystone of the standard model. And this is a photo from the, conference, from the press conference where the Higgs was announced, the Higgs dis particle discovery was announced. And we see here Francois Anglais and Peter Higgs. These are two theorists who predicted this particle. And whoops. Oh, yes, you noticed. <laughs> you noticed. So they received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2013. And indeed, Francois Anglais and I have the same tie. It's a tie with the particles of the standard model. It was designed by Gerhard Hoft. He designed the tie. He is one of the greatest living physicists. He got the Nobel Prize in 1999. He's one of the architects of the standard model. And this tie was given as a gift to the guests in his 60th birthday party. Nice way to notice that. So I thought it would be appropriate to bring it to the top. So this standard model is extremely successful. A small number of parameters, like the particle masses, explain a lot of experimental results. Really, billions and billions of experimental results are explained using a handful of parameters, 18 to be precise. And it's not contradicted with any known experiment. I'll soon qualify this a little bit. And it's unprecedented success. Unprecedented in the sense that most quantities, as I said before, cannot be calculated or cannot be measured. But a few quantities can be measured and calculated to an extremely high accuracy. And there, the agreement between theory and experiment is spectacular, 10 significant digits. So we can measure something like 1.0 three, five, seven, nine, three, et cetera, 10 digits. All 10 digits match. And as, as we get more and more accuracy in this measurement, we probe the standard model in more and more detail. And the fact that it works to 10 significant digits shows that we really know what we are doing. So there's no doubt that this standard model is correct. However, as in Kelvin's time, we have open questions. These are the clouds over this model. So the standard model exhibits a pattern. We should explain this pattern. We have no idea why the pattern is there. We don't understand the origin of these particles. Why do we have this periodic table of the matter particles? What's the origin of the forces? Why do we have these three forces and not five forces? What determines the strength of the forces? And there are all these other parameters, these numbers that need to be understood we don't know what they are, why they have the values they do. And a deeper theory will explain that. At the moment, we don't know what they, what, what's underlying this. A little bit more technical, that the model is incomplete. We have several reasons to believe that. 
First of all, the Higgs boson mass is unstable, very much like Newton's concern about the stability of the standard of the solar system. Neutrino masses are zero in the standard model that were measured to be non-zero, and we need to understand quantum gravity. I'll come back to that soon. So <clears throat> this is a little bit more technical. Then very soon, we'll have more data. First of all, the accelerator is being up upgraded. We'll have higher energy and more collisions. So we'll, this will give us more information with higher resolution. And we can hope there could be new discoveries. We also talk about building another accelerator with even more energy. It's not clear whether it will happen and when it, when it will happen and uh, whether it will be built at all. So that's what I wanted to say about particle physics. In summary, we have a spectacular model. It works extremely well. But we have these clouds in Kelvin's language, these little things that tell us that there must be new physics to be understood. I'd like to move now to the second standard model, the st standard model of cosmology, which describes the universe as a whole and its origin. And again, this is a long and beautiful topic, a long and beautiful story, and I'll be very brief here. And the elements that go into it is the Big Bang, this early explosion that created the universe, and it's ex been expanding ever since. And it describes the evolution of the universe, starting from the time it was a fraction of a second old uh, until today and a little bit into the future. And it explains the origin of matter in the universe. And it also explains ga how galaxies are formed, how stars are formed, etc. So it's, again, a very long and beautiful story. And as in the model of particle physics, I'm going to start with the source of data. Where does the data come from? So in, for particle physics, we want to understand what's going on at very short distances, so we need a very powerful magnifying glass or a very powerful microscope, and that was the accelerator. Here, instead, we need a very powerful telescope to look very, very far in the sky. And we can put filters in front of the telescope to look at the sky at different wavelengths. We can look at radio, we can look at visible light, we can look at x-rays, we can look at microwaves, and so forth. So one of the most important things is in the microwave, very much like in the microwave oven that you have in your kitchen. And the universe is surrounded, the universe is filled with microwave radiation, which can be thought of as the afterglow of the Big Bang, or the echo of the Big Bang. It was measured about more than 50 years ago for the first time. And then people measured it in different directions in the sky. And it was almost the same, regardless of where you look, to enormous accuracy, the accuracy of about one part in 100,000. In order to get to see this deviation in the microwave radiation in different directions, people had to send satellites so that they could measure this radiation from space. And the first experiment, the first satellite that measured the deviation, this is a map of the sky, the red spots are hotter than the cold spots, which are in blue here. This map of the sky that showed that the, the radiation is not exactly uniform. The first measurement of that was done by an a satellite called COBE. It's an acronym for Cosmic Background Explorer. And the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2006 was given to John Mother and George Smooth for this discovery. The state of the art here, which is the map that I put here, came from a European satellite called Planck, named after the German physicist Max Planck. He appeared earlier in the talk. He was in these two Solvay conferences, his photo was there, and he will also appear in the talk, later in the talk, in a different context. So this is one source of information. The second source of information about the universe as a whole is a survey, survey of supernovae. Now, supernovae is the plural of supernova, and one supernova is an exploding star. It explodes with a huge amount of energy, so much that it can outshine the galaxy it, come, it sits in. So this supernova sits in some galaxy, then it explodes. When it explodes, it's very bright, much brighter than the galaxy, and it can be observed from here. And these three people, Rice, Perlmutter, and Schmidt, looked at these, at these supernovae, and they realized, by looking at them very carefully, they could check 
how fast they move, how fast they recede away from us. And they realized that they know, the universe is not only expanding, but the universe is also accelerating. This was a complete shock in physics. The universe is not just expanding, it's actually expanding faster and faster and faster. It expands today faster than it expanded yesterday, and it's faster than it expanded a billion years ago. So today, and in the future, it will expand even faster than that. We don't know how long that would last. And for that, they got the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics. So taking all this data together, a standard model of cosmology was understood. And again, it is based on principles. In particle physics, we had quantum mechanics and special relativity. Here we have general relativity. Again, a theory of Einstein. This is the modern version of Newton's theory of gravity. And the Big Bang, this explosion that we talked about before. So this is the, these are the principles. And then we have the composition, very much like the particles in the standard model of particle physics. And the matter that we are made out of, proton, neutrons, electrons, all the matter that we see around us is about 5% of the total budget that we can see here. About 27% is dark matter. This is another kind of matter. We don't know what it is, but we know exactly that it's there, and we know where it, it resides, and we can map where it is because it's dark, we can't see it, but it does influence, through gravity, it influences the, mo the motion of other objects. And the majority, nearly 70% of the total budget, is some dark energy. And this is the force that makes the universe not only expand, but actually accelerate. So the expansion makes, becomes strong faster and faster. So these, two, these principles and these numbers small set of numbers, give us this model, which is extremely detailed, extremely beautiful, and it explains all measurements. There's no contradiction between theory and experiment on this front. It's really quite amazing. When I entered physics many years ago, this field was not only a mess, it was something that people thought, this is something that we will never understand. And that was only a few decades ago. This field was completely transformed over the last few years, over the last tens of years. And now we have this beautiful coherent model and people say, oh, that's the end of physics. So this has been a complete transformation. And the reason I think this is not the end of physics is that just like in particle physics, we have these clouds, these open problems in this model, these open problems that tell us there must be more to the universe or to physics than what we know. There are many questions we need to understand. What is this dark matter? We have these particles, there's this matter out there, which is not the kind of matter that we know about. In fact, this is also an argument, one of the ideas that these are new particles, very much like the particles of particle physics, that are out there, and for some reason we cannot see them. And that's another reason that there must be new physics beyond the standard model of particle physics. What is this dark energy? This is a big mystery was added so that the model works, but we don't know what it is. And as always in this talk, what's the origin of these parameters? We have this pattern, we have to explain the pattern. Why do we have this pattern? And more broadly, what's the origin of the universe? What happens when the universe was even shorter, younger than that? What is the moment of creation? What really happened there? And also, what's the fate of the universe in the far future? So one idea that is extremely popular is the idea of cosmic inflation. This is the idea that there was an early period of very rapid expansion, that the universe expanded much faster than it expands today. And if you just make this qualitative assumption, some of the pattern of the standard model of cosmology is explained. This is supported by a lot of evidence, but there are still some puzzles that need to be understood. So this is not yet completely settled. And as in particle physics, we have this nearly complete model. We have these open problems that tell us there must be, must be more physics, and there will be more data soon, because there are new experiments, and they will give us more data, and hopefully they will give us more clues how to continue. So we talked about putting filters in front of the telescope, looking at the telescope with light or radiation with different wavelengths. The other thing we can do in with the telescope is put Polaroid glasses in front of it. 
So if you look at Polaroid glasses and you look at the sky or you look around and you rotate the glasses, you see that the, path, the colors change or the intensity changes. The reason for that is that Polaroid glasses allow only light with certain polarization to go through. So we can do the same thing with our telescopes. So that's what it is. This is a telescope near the South Pole, which measures the polarization of this microwave radiation. And they're working very hard to improve the measurement. And sooner or later, they, will, they might have new results that will give us more information about the early universe. The second kind of new data is even more exciting and more recent. We talked about looking at radiation from the sky different wavelengths, but they are all electromagnetic radiation. A few years ago, this gravitational detector called LIGO, detectors called LIGO, measured gravitational radiation, which again gives us more information. And we can only hope that this will give us more data and more information and will tell us how to proceed with our understanding of the standard model of cosmology. So we talked about the standard model of cosmology, how well it works, what the open questions are, and how there will be more data. But there's one more big question, which is probably the biggest conceptual question that we have to face. We have two standard models. One explains what happens at very short distances. This is what happens in particle physics. And another standard model for cosmology explaining what happens to the universe as a whole. We shouldn't have two standard models. We should have only one standard model. We need to merge these models. The principles of the model of particle physics is that it uses quantum mechanics and special relativity. These are two of the revolutions of 20th century physics. And the standard model of cosmology, <clears throat> sorry, uses general relativity, the other revolution of uh, 20th century physics. So we have to put these two ideas together. We have to put quantum mechanics and general relativity together this has been an ongoing puzzle for a long time, raised for the first time by Planck, who, who was one of the participants in the two Solvay conferences that I mentioned before, and this European satellite is named after him. And he calculated that these questions of what happens when we have both gravity is important and quantum mechanics is important, this happens at very short distances. It's called the Planck scale. Distances of 10 to the minus 35 meters, and at time scales of 10 to the minus 43 seconds. These are tiny times and tiny distances. So understanding physics at that scale, this is the holy grail. This is where fundamental physics is. And our goal is really to understand this biggest conceptual question. Once this is achieved, we'll understand what happened to the universe within, when it was 10 to the minus 43 seconds old. We'll really understand the origin of the universe. We'll really understand creation. So this is a long goal. Long time. It will take a long time. But we have a best candidate for it. And this is string theory. And again, this is a huge topic. I can give a whole talk just about that. But instead, I'll be here very brief. I have only one slide about it because I think it will really be not just to give such a talk and not mention it. So over the past several decades, we've seen amazing progress. We understand that this is a consistent model of both quantum mechanics and gravity. Amazing new insights were derived. And we found new phys deep physics with impacts on both mathematics and other branches of physics. Why am I mentioning that? Historically, deep ideas had impact long beyond, much beyond what they were designed to do. You wanted to solve one problem, and in the course of doing that, you solve the problem, and you also solve many other problems. My favorite example for that is calculus. Newton invented calculus part, partly in order to understand the motion of bodies. This is what he wanted to do. And he invented calculus. That later had impact in other branches of science, in mathematics, this is very central. Calculus is very central. In all of physics, calculus is very central. In chemistry, and it even makes its way to social sciences. So this is the hallmark of a deep idea. Calculus is very deep. And what we see here in string theory is something very similar. It works for quantum gravity. That's, this is beautiful. 
this is the main goal, this is what we should be focusing on, but along the way, it has offshoots, all sorts of impact on other branches of physics, in condensed matter physics, particle physics, and all sorts of branches in mathematics, which again, this didn't have to be like that way, and this is one of the signs that we're stepping in the right direction. But there are huge challenges. We do not understand the underlying principles of string theory. So maybe some of the young people here who came to TASI this year will be able to solve these problems. We also need experimental confirmation. Physics is about having a theory that agrees with experiment. So it's absolutely essential to have experimental confirmation of string theory. At the moment, we don't have that. It might take a very long time to reach these goals, but this is certainly a worthwhile effort because this is what physics is all about. Physics is about understanding the fundamental laws of nature and understanding how to put quantum mechanics and gravity together is the fundamental laws of nature. In this context, I would like to quote Einstein about a very deep idea. Einstein was very interested in this picture that I put forward here. Of, uh, we all, all will have models after models. Every one of them is more complete than the previous one. And the parameters, these numbers that we don't know how to predict in today's models, will be predicted by tomorrow's model. But there are always leftover parameters, leftover numbers that we cannot predict and we have to measure. Eventually, we'll find the ultimate theory of the universe, the final theory. This might take centuries, but we believe that there is a theory out there. Once we are there, we'll not be able to say, oh, there are still parameters that will be understood by a later model, because this is supposed to be the last one. So Einstein said that in the final model, there shouldn't be any free parameters. And in his words, there are no arbitrary constants. Nature is so constituted that it is possible logically to lay down such strongly determined laws that within these laws, only rationally determined constants occur not constants, therefore, whose numerical value would be changed without destroying the theory. Well, this is quite a long sentence. Well, he was educated in Germany. Um, but I think it conveys a very nice idea that eventually we should have a model with no free parameters. There should not be any number that we should adjust. The model will make sense only for one set of numbers, and everything will follow from that. It might take a long time to reach there, but it's a good idea to keep in mind the long-term goals. This is where we are heading. Well, this was what Einstein thought, but I thought I should give a cautionary remark, a cautionary historical example from a slide I gave earlier in the talk. Kepler also wanted to explain all the parameters in his model, the orbits of the planets, remember? And he had this idea with, the, with beautiful math which might explain the motion of the orbits of the planets, the size of the orbits of the planets, based on the platonic solids. And it turned out to be the wrong question. <laughs> the reason it's the wrong question is these are the right numbers, these are the right parameters in our solar system, but these are not the right parameters for other solar systems. So understanding the origin of the sizes of the orbits of the planet is not a good idea, is not a good question, this is not a good question to ask, it's not deep. This is just an environmental thing. It's true in our solar system, but not elsewhere. This leads people to suggest that maybe the same is true for all the other parameters that we discussed today. And this is a complete paradigm shift. It's called the multiverse. And the idea is that maybe that some of the questions about these parameters that we discuss are also the wrong questions. Maybe the universe is much larger than we think. There are many, many universes. We live in just one of them. And the laws of physics in the other universes are different. For example, the electron might have a different mass in the other universes, just like the size of the orbit of the planets in our solar system is not the same as in another solar system. Our electron and their electrons have different masses. Maybe they even have different elementary particles out there. Maybe even the number of space dimensions are different in the other universes. So in other words, some of the parameters that we would like to explain, maybe we shouldn't explain them. Maybe they are not fundamental at all. Now, some physicists love this idea. 
It's very controversial. Some physicists love this idea. Other physicists hate it. But it is a logical possibility. It is a logical possibility. And I think we would like to know for sure whether it's right or wrong. This is a very concrete question. Is it right or wrong? This is a very dramatic statement if it's right. It's a very dramatic statement if it's wrong. And we would like to know the answer. So when I raise questions that need to be understood, this is clearly a question that needs to be asked. Is this right or wrong? So if you fell asleep, this is the time to wake up. I'm going to summarize the talk. These are the takeaway lessons. We have had a long journey describing physics over a large range of distances. The standard model of particle physics, and we even went to shorter distances to the Planck scale. And we also talked about cosmology of the universe as a whole. We described these two beautiful standard models that work extremely well. We agree with experiment. We have no doubt that they are correct. But it's also clear that there must be new physics beyond these models. Again, in the language of Kelvin, there are clouds over there. And we can only imagine and hope that just as Kelvin's clouds led to a complete revolution of science, revolu complete revolution of science that impacted technology, complete revolution of technology that even affects everyday life, we can hope that maybe these clouds will lead to similar revolutions, either scientific revolutions, conceptual revolutions, and maybe even some technological revolutions. Until we are there, we don't know whether this will happen or not. So what are these clouds? One challenge is to unify these models to understand quantum gravity. And perhaps a simpler problem is to understand all these patterns that we talked about. Where did all the parameters come from? Why do the particles have the masses they do? Why do we have that percentage of dark matter rather than another percentage of dark matter? What is the dark matter? And so forth. And fortunately, there will be new input into these questions, new experimental input, that maybe they will guide us toward finding the answer. So I think when I started the talk and I said that some people think that physics is over, and I think that the main lesson is that they are wrong, Physics is not over. Physics is exciting. Physics will continue to be exciting. I think the future is guaranteed to be exciting. So stay tuned. Thank you for your attention. what it will be or what the clue signs that there will be? Yes, so I mentioned problems that need to be addressed. I do not know whether the explanations addressing them will happen tomorrow or next year or in 10 years or in 100 years. That I cannot predict. But given the rate of progress over the last several decades, I see no sign of slowing down. And I think progress will continue. And I believe that similar talks given here, say, 10 years from today, will be completely different than this talk. Some of the questions that are raised today will be realized as totally misguided. Other questions will have a clear answer. And hopefully, the answers will be conceptual and would be as conceptual as in the previous time it happened, at the time of Kelvin. Well, you, there are different things you can say about why. Why in the physics sense is why do things fall? 
they fall because they are attracted to the earth. That's one why. And the other is kind of a more theological question, which I think is what you're alluding to. Yeah. Is, yeah. So that's a very interesting question, whether we really need God in order to explain any of, any of physics. Maybe that's what you're asking me about. And so maybe we do. I'm not saying that we don't. But so far, we've done pretty well without it. No, we didn't come for a stop. The whole point of this talk is that... It's still rolling, but uh, for example, the Large Hadron Collider, uh, apparently, from what I read in my paper, knocked down the string theory because it, it uh, showed that the particles predicted by the string theory did not, in fact, exist. So, well, the, the question about what's the next... The rumors about the death of string theory were premature. <laughs> string theory did not predict any particle that the Large Hadron Collider should discover. And when it didn't discover particles, that's perfectly consistent with string theory. String theory is not dead by any sense. Now, Did the particles in the uh, energy range that could have been found? No, not, definitely not. Okay, well, the newspapers are not uh, The newspaper got, this is not, will not be the first time. <laughs> this will not be the first time. Uh, the other question is the more theological one. It might be that in the end, there will be something like God in the final theory of physics. Maybe. At the moment, we do not see any sign of it. And over the last several centuries, science progressed, made a lot of physics, without using the idea of God. Now, maybe this will come to a stop. At the moment, I don't see a stop. But well, Well, understanding how it happened, we should distinguish in science between things we do not understand and things that we need God to explain. That's not the same thing. There are many things that we did not understand 100 years ago, and we did understand, say, 90 years ago. And there are things we didn't understand 90 years ago, but we didn't understand 80 years ago. So the fact that we don't understand something now does not mean that we will never understand it. We're making progress. We understand it. it might be that there will be zero progress from today, say for a hundred years. That might happen. At that point, you could say, well, maybe we are stuck. But as long as progress continues, and it continues very rapidly, I don't see any sign to say, well, maybe today in 2019, this is when it stops. Until now, we made progress, and we'll not be able to make any progress later. In fact, I believe that progress will happen and progress will accelerate. Because if you look at the progress that was made during the 20th century, it was much more than the progress that was made during the 19th century. The number of people working on science today is a lot more than the people who worked on science 100 years ago. The, the number of papers being published is much larger. So there's a lot more progress. Did you measure progress in terms of number of people working on stuff, number of papers published, and amount of funding? No, that's not how I measure. You're twisting what I said. <laughs> progress is... Perhaps uh, you could do this offline? Yes. Anybody else? Yes, way in the back. That's an excellent question. So what Planck showed, and that he showed that more than 100 years ago, he computed this number. That was more than 100 years ago before, the, just in the early days of quantum mechanics. He already understood this number. And he did not say what will happen there. What he did say was that at this scale, something very dramatic will happen. That's what he said. Something very dramatic will happen there. Because this is the place where both quantum mechanics and gravity are both important. So he understood that at that scale, these short distances and these short time scales, something very dramatic will happen. Now, we don't know what will happen. There are various speculations about what will happen. The one popular idea is that the whole notion of space and the whole notion of time will break down once we get to these shorter distances. 
We don't understand how it works, and we can talk more about it, but this is, not, this is something that is still a vague idea. It's not something concrete. I tried in the talk to stick to very, very concrete ideas that I, we know for sure are true. So we don't know what will happen there. This is a huge question. From my perspective, what happens at these distances is the most important question in physics, most, the most important question in science. This is what science is all about. Science is about what happens at these distances. Then there are many other questions, how to solve the equations that I've talked about before. But this is where the fundamental laws of physics are at this time scale, at these distances. We don't know what the answer is. And as I said, it might take 100 years. It might take 300 years. But I think this is our long-term goal, understanding what happens there. Hi, how are you? I think you two are, I think you two are slightly at cross purposes. Good to see you. What? Um, the question here. Thank you, Nadia. That was very enjoyable. Thank you. Uh, just one small thing. Um, so, Kudel's second incompleteness uh, 